Without data, you're just an emotional mess. On this week's episode, we're joined by Jens Robinson, head of March on Gyms and co-owner of the Gym Owner Network and the PFCA. Navigating a company out of a phase of uncertainty, that's leadership. Leadership for most of the people listening today is not what they read in the book. When leading a team through values, it puts the values as the filter in which I'm going to measure your performance and you're going to measure your own performance. The whole kind of umbrella is live, learn, lead. No one's, no one's teaching you this stuff. Most gym owners don't do the thing purely because they are avoiding the difficult conversation. This is an episode you're not going to want to miss. We hope you enjoy. Jens, welcome back to the FMA podcast. And for all those listening, welcome back to me. I've not been on the show for a little while, but you'll be glad to know that I still work at FMA. I wasn't fired or anything like that. I've just been just been busy um, in the office. So Ben's been taken over. But I wanted to come back to speak to Jens because every time we sit down and speak, I always enjoy the conversations we have. And last time we spoke, it was just under a year ago, I believe, you and Ollie came to do the podcast. And it's been it's been a busy year for, uh, for you and uh, Gym Owner Network and uh, March on as well, the gyms have both grown massively gym owner network has grown massively and if you could reflect on this last year this period what have been the biggest kind of lessons for you in terms of growth of of, of the gyms and gym owner network and maybe growth within yourself as well oh awesome well firstly charlie good good to be back thank you very much for having me uh do you know what if you if you asked me these kind of questions a few years ago i would have been able to answer them far better because I used to be quite good at the practice of reflection. Um, but over the last 12 months, we've been moving so fast that I wouldn't be able to tell you much about wh- you know where we've come from, what we've been doing. But if I took a moment to just take a breath and think, I think largely it would be the fact that we've been trying to professionalize what is very much a startup mentality with everything that we do. So you're the mentality that you have when you're a startup and you're doing all the different jobs and you're just kind of going hell for leather, at some point you need to graduate to being a lot more professional in the way you report analytics, the way you track data, the way you show up to meetings, the way you hold people accountable, the way you manage performance of people within the team. And if there's one thing that's truly happened in the last 12 months is just like a a bit of maturity shown in the way we we operate. Um, if if you look at the the kind of whole march on type umbrella from the gyms to supplements to online to the education with the PFCA to the gym owner network and and everything in between is like treating each one of those things as as a vertical um, and recognizing the organizational structure as it pertains to the verticals, but then the people who are responsible horizontally as well. So that that. I guess sophistication or, or graduation or, or growth has been it's been really cool. My personal growth amongst all that is, you know, last last year Feb, I um I took the role of head of gyms for March on to drive the the commercial growth and 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 the actual, you know, just taking those gyms to another level. Largely to just give Ollie space to help Ollie just grow March on for all the amazing things that March on is doing. And it's always something I've always been involved in uh, without any real kind of like formal engagement. But as of Feb last year, I took that role and I saw it as a role of both really cool excitement and responsibility, but also one of like massive ownership because it's something I really care about. So stepping into that, I was like, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wouldn't say I had like imposter syndrome, but I was definitely like, okay, how can I do this actually at scale? Because of course I can, like everyone, we can we can mentor others, and when you mentor other people, in a weird way, you give them your best advice of what you have in your capacity right now. But it's up to them to go do the thing. I now had to mentor the staff within March on Gyms, but the responsibility laid on my head whether or not I actually worked or not. Yeah. Right, and like the, it just raised the stakes a lot more, and that was quite cool. Well, fortunately, it, it has worked out right because the Harkins mm. and Gym is the biggest it's ever been. Stratford mm. is, has had tremendous growth in the last year as well. And for those that don't know, if you could just run us through the model of both sites and maybe price points of each membership and where we're at membership-wise, that would be that'd be really great. Yeah, cool. So um, a, a snapshot. So we've got three sites at the moment. Um, site number one is Harpenden HQ. We run a small group personal training model, a six to one. That's been going since 2016. Ollie founded it with his brother and his best mate. 
And uh, that's grown from strength to strength. The, the key thing about that is the coaching product is one that is second to none, um, but it's also one that has never rested on its laurels. Like, it, like you know, as a team, we do CPD three times a week to keep iterating on, on the quality of the product. That model, we have over 300 members um, at, at, a, at a price range that is more than what most personal trainers charge. Then HQ, um, sorry, that's HQ, Stratford. Stratford is the, is the different concept that we brought to the market where we wanted to bring the best of what we do in a small group setting, but also plug where we felt large group fitness was going wrong. So how could we at scale take strength conditioning with a little bit of like, let's call it functional bodybuilding to use a commercial term with developing great aerobic capacity and truly take VO2 max up and strength up, improve motor control and all the rest of it, all while enhancing a community type feel. So we wanted to create a one of a kind gym experience where you wouldn't find equipment better than what we've co-created with Black Box, like unmatched in terms of gym design and, and facility. Um, a mixture of tech, bringing the tech from our online app and bringing that into the gym member experience, bringing the, the whole coaching excellence to the floor. Like March on Gyms is all about having the best coaches representing our brand and, and influencing the members that, that we serve. And then being able to wrap this around with a really cool community feel that's all like education centric. So that is a 15 to one model of which we're at 175 members at an average yield of 250. Then you've got your White City House residency. So Soho House, White City, we've got a residency there. We took a residency there about uh, nine, 10 months ago, committed to growing that to 100 members. We're just about there doing really cool work. Our team there are, are doing awesome stuff. And what's crazy about that is it's not like any other gym. You can't market like you would normally market. You can only service so house members that are residents to that house right and you've got to be able to facilitate someone who's already paying for a gym membership way you know well over 250 pound a month and tell them to pay another 250 pound a month to come train with you in a group setting so a completely unique experience in terms of having to market sell it compared to any other gym crazy crazy yeah. the only way i could i could uh, describe it is it's a bit like being a PT on the gym floor back in the day where you had to work the floor to get clients. It's like almost like that. That's the only way you can prospect, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but yeah, at, at present, the gyms are doing incredible work. The the, the teams and the the kind of head coaches at, at each site have, have grown in leaps and bounds in the last year to just be a lot more kind of performance minded, to be able to have data inform their decisions, to be able to better lead the team so that everyone knows where they're at, knows knows how they can improve, knows how they can grow in their careers. So all of that's really cool to be quite, I think in philosophy, people talk about the career pathways for their coaches, but in practice, many get it wrong. Um, we've certainly got it wrong for many, many years. Like the, you would say something, but in practice it would go amiss. I think now it's starting to become a lot more clear in how everyone can grow within their roles as it pertains to this this whole piece. And in terms of the team and progression, um, was it like before there was a very lineal path that you assumed people would move to, but actually each individual moves in a different way depending on their skills or or, 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 or am I completely wrong there? What was it you kind of meant by that in terms of the, the pathway of progression for the, for the coaches? I think I think if it's, it's different per site in terms of the model, but if we look at like a small group PT, uh, coaching responsibility not only are you coaching a lot of hours on the gym floor let's say 30 35 hours a week but then there's other responsibilities that will impact your value on the business now it might be pertaining to what we call within the network like cohort management so how well are you managing your cohorts designated to each specific coach what's your capacity so a junior coach might be able to handle 10 to 15 but a senior coach or a a very sophisticated coach with skills across nutrition, behavioral change, lifestyle optimization, they could they could go at scale to 80, right? So it's like, how how valuable are you to the business? Yeah. Right. And then being able to track that with a with a level of data rather than just like, oh yeah, you're working really hard. I feel like you're working really hard. 
And when, and when you say that uh, an experienced coach can scale to 80, is that looking after 80 clients, being mm. responsible for the communication of that? And is, is that how you delegate the responsibility? It's through the coaches to look after a subsection of clients? Well, that's, um, that's quite a good question. I think, so in, in practice, what it is, is like you will have a group of clients who you are responsible for from a off the floor coaching experience. So when we define like a, a gym model, one of the things we'll look at is what is your product both on and off the floor? On the floor would be like, is it a six to one? Is it a four to one? Is it large group, small group, whatever? And then it's like, what are the things we're doing off the floor to drive value, to drive retention, to drive impact? If let's say in a high end, small group PT facility, where you're charging the right amount of money, I'm not saying you run small group, but you don't charge appropriately. Say you charge appropriately and you can facilitate this. Your coaches will be, will be designated a group of people that either uh, resp that respond well to their person their personality type and their skill set so the the psychographic of this cohort is really important the the kind of personality typing that we might match client to coach with is really important based on their needs and wants so like let's say for example we might have sophie who has a, a particular skill set in women's health and if there's a sub subsection of members who have a particular area around women's health, maybe menopause, et cetera, she might have that as a, as a large category of people that she will serve. So then she is able to, whether it's a broadcast message, whether it's intimate conversations, it will just depend on the client journey. We talk about like a client roadmap where you'll have different stages of the client's journey based on their level of autonomy. Any good coaching service is one that's trying to drive someone to more autonomy rather than more dependency. So our communication is not like, hey, we want to have you check in once a week. Like if you're having to force check-ins in your business, you're, it's, it's very remedial, so to speak. But if we can force better levels of conversation, better levels of uh, ownership over their journey through education, through challenge, through coaching, then we can upgrade how they operate and upgrade their levels of questions or their their levels of like what they bring to the table. And and how does that look practically? So where where you say that um, you know just doing a check in once a week, which some people might not even want or mm. find a bit annoying. How do you practically have that communication with the client where it's seem where it's seamless and effortless and, mm. and gives them their autonomy? Are there any practical things that you do um, with the team on a weekly, monthly basis at all? So uh, like I said, it depends on the person, right? But also depends on our system and, and the level of authority that we bring to said thing. So when you, go to, when you go to a doctor and you describe your symptoms, you don't want the doctor to be like, oh, what, what would you like to do, right? Um, you kind of want the doctor to be like, okay, do this, do that and crack on. But that's, that's an immediate like, moment of pain and looking for some kind of solution. Over time, that, that awareness of pain starts to move away and now you're just trying to find things that are rewarding, moving you towards areas of, of reward and just feeling great. It's through that that your levels of like intimacy versus and prescription versus like ownership and autonomy start to change. So maybe in your first six weeks of a client journey, it might be far more prescriptive and intimate. Then the next phase might be maybe once a month, depending on their goals, their needs, their desires, time of the year, what they're trying to achieve. Then they might move into once a quarter, potentially, depending on who they are. Like with us in a March on Gym, we talk about the without, the without limits lifestyle. And basically a long-standing member within our gym who's had great exposure to high quality coaching, whose movement capacity is really good, whose fitness capacity is really good, um, and their body composition is in a place in which they have great re relationships with, with food, great relationships with training. They are able to fulfill social life, work life, everything all in one. And they're about two or three kilos away from like their, their best self. And if they wanted to dial in before a holiday or dial in before something, they can. And we've got seasonal challenges as a community to jump in and do. Like now as we're going into summer, we do what's called Ready, Shreddy, Go. And it's just like an internal thing where where designated groups get put into teams and it's a team group uh, percentage weight loss on the in-body or percentage fat loss on this or percentage muscle gain on that, whatever. And it's, it becomes like 
more than just you and your battle on weight loss. It's like, it's a team thing, how we're going to do it. So again, it drives product off the floor. Yeah, so it sounds like it's really dependent on who the client is, what their situation is and the coach and their strengths. And it, the communication could be in many different forms, depending on where they're at within their journey. Exactly. And that that makes a lot of sense to me. And then I also think that sounds hard to track. So let's say you as a leader of um, you know, the Harpenden gym and you kind of want to know what's going on with the clients, how, how, how are you able to get a sense of, what's going on with each client or like how, how how do you get that information? Like what, what are the KPIs you're tracking to be able to show that the clients are having a good level of communication and being serviced? Fantastic question. So if it pertains to our model of the cohort system, right? At scale, you can't know intimately where everyone is at what stage or whatever. You just can't, right? But when you can pass on responsibility to people in your team and show them how they can win at their job, people can now actually excel in their workplace. Um, we talk about coaching being the minimal viable product. Like that gets you in the door. But now what keeps you in the door and keeps you growing within the business is different skills that might pertain to your role or to the growth of the business, whether it's marketing, social media, whatever. But the cohort thing for us is really important. In terms of the KPIs, for easy math, let's say you look after 100 clients. That's what you're designated to do. We're going to have a cohort meeting once a week, and you're going to present me your numbers in, as it pertains to who's at risk, who's doing really well, right? And do they have to report on each client? They can go, they're good, I had a chat with them, they seem great. This at, 100 you, at, at 100, you can't, right? But like, let's say, for example, you're at risk. Every Whatever coaching service you have, you know your next five clients are going to leave. Yeah. You 100% know that, right? So it's like, okay, let's look at those at-risk ones. What are we doing? What aren't we doing? Um, it might be that you haven't seen Cindy for the last week. You've messaged her a couple of times. But in this cohort meeting with other coaches, I'll be like, do you know what? Cindy's, Cindy's ghosted me the last two texts. And then the other coach might be like, don't worry, I saw her last night. She's training at eight o'clock this, this week. Works a nightmare. The only time she can come in at eight. She actually told me to tell you that she's seen your messages. She's sorry, she just haven't had, had, hasn't had a chance. Bosh, done. And tech. So now you know that person's not high risk and Sweet. then you can move on. Carry on. Equally, I in our, in our gym, we practice looking at the top as well and going, who's shining at the moment? Who's, who, who have you had great breakthrough with? And it might be like, oh, I've had breakthrough with said like said person. What's happened there? Let's case study that. Let's case study that. Let's talk about that in detail. It might be that we might want to go into the messaging and be like, what's working, what's not working. So those are like the reporting stuff. But then the numbers, if we look at like the KPIs, I I want my my small group PT gyms to oper operate at a three percent three percent attrition rate or less. Okay, if my coaches are losing more than 3% a month, that's an area of concern that I, as, as a leader, like I'd expect Alex of HQ to go in and sit down with that person and go, right, show me the last five people who have left. Show me the messages that you've been going back and forth with. Show me the comms. Show me how you've held them accountable. All of it. So we can go into the weeds and be like, okay, is it a capability thing? Is it a scale thing? Is it you said you do something and you didn't do it? Whatever it is, like let's figure it out because then we can plug it. And so you have attrition as a whole for the gym and then do you also have attrition for each individual coach with their clients that they have? So someone could be exactly. crushing it at 1%, someone's at 6%. Are they letting the side down essentially? So you're really getting into the weeds of where this attrition is coming from because most people most people don't track their numbers and that's mm -hmm. probably something um we, we were talking about earlier but then the ones that do probably are just looking at the attrition rate as a whole yeah but you're going to like another level of each coach has an allotted amount of clients how many are they saving and keeping and um and, and serving well 100 percent. because again attrition is <clears throat> attrition is the byproduct of someone churning out of your business because they've lost sight of future in, in your establishment. So at some point they've gone, I don't see my future here in this in this service, whatever it is, right? And this goes for any kind of coaching practice. Do you think that, that it always boils down to that one thing? It's like, I don't see 
the vision or, or future. Look, a apart from the extreme bad service, they were rude. They were this. It, it's it's more. It's or less. a loss of connection between what am I doing versus how does this how does how, like what does this mean to me? All right. So why am I coming to the gym three times a week to do this thing? How does it, how does this program how does this fulfill my goals? What I'm doing? How does my actions? Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's a it's a disconnect. Now. Every gym owner, when they report their levers, they'll be like, oh, but it's for the normal reasons. Moving out, moving job, moving country, pregnancy. Man, yeah. I've never heard of more people getting pregnant in my life. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I hear that a lot. Oh, yeah, when the people that leave always leave for good reasons. Um, we keep everyone most of the time. Yeah, um, it's it's absolute jokes. But I, I, I liken it to the fact that, like, be so good as a gym that people don't want to leave and they'd rather not take the job the other side of the country because they're like, do you know what? I've, my home life is sweet. My gym life is sweet. I've got great social life. I don't need that extra whatever it is. Do you know what I mean? And um, it might be idealistic to say, of course, but that's the kind of way in which you need to approach attrition. Every time someone leaves, look at it, whether it's a normal reason or not, that's enough reason for you to investigate as to what's going on. So if we look at attrition at the top, if you only just see it as like this global number, you'll never be able to figure out what it is that it, uh, that's causing the problem. Is it because the programming shit? Is it because there's one coach who just doesn't show up on the coaching floor and they don't like it? Is it that the community engagement or interaction isn't great? Like we need to find out what that is. Yeah. Because otherwise we can't fix it. Can you can you give an example? And obviously you don't have to say any specific names of where one person who generally speaking, is a, a a good performing team member, but there was a bit of a dip in their numbers. It was unusual, and you had to identify what was going on. Is it, does anything come to mind there at all? 100%. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I can, I can riff on so many case studies of this happening, both internally for us, um, for the development of our coaches, as well as all the gyms that we look after. And fundamentally what it is, and, and this, is, this is probably quite hard to hear for some people, is that most people think they're good coaches, but they're fucking shit, right? So then what they do is they they give really, really bad coaching advice to other people that isn't, isn't meaningful to the client that they're talking to. It's the same kind of information that you might as well just do on a free Instagram post. Like here's three things to, you know, add, you know, here's three ways to add protein into your diet. Where good coaching comes in is like, how well are we asked? Like how good are the questions that we're asking? How how good are the conversations that we're having with that potential client on the other side and how can we create meaning as to where they are now and the little thing that they need to do to change their current system that makes it meaningful to them they might need more protein but we need to do better going okay well what is their understanding of protein what does their normal resource look like to get more protein what would be their normal go-to to get more protein what does their normal day-to-day -day look like oh do you know what? when they go to work during the week they absolutely nail nail it, but then the three days that work from home, they mess it up. It's like, okay, well, what's the system that we need to do there for them in that particular thing? Going here is three ways to get more protein. That's anyone can do that. That's not coaching. That's just instructing. A good coach has been able to like it's it's a thing that we do with someone, not to someone. Yeah. So there's the, you know, the know how of training and the mechanics, and then there's actually the communication and how you deliver that information that you've hundred percent. Do you, th this might upset a few people. Um, you know, there's lots of coaches that have been PTs for over 10 years. Do you think there's a big portion of those that you would classify as like bad coaches? Do you know one of the one of the guys on our on our team, Matt Connolly, and um, a f funny story. I've tried to get him on the team for the last three years. He used to mentor me as a as a coach, but also uh, so he was my coach through my programming but I'd also jump into his business mentorship. This is going back in like 20, 2017. Um, and the fact that he's on my team now is like so cool because he's an absolute legend. Ollie and I are freaking stoked to have him on board. And he, sa he said something phenomenal. He's like, most PTs don't have 10 years experience. They have one year's experience that they've repeated 10 times. Mm. Yeah, I like that. They've just been doing the same thing over and over again and not actually upgrading. And how do you, I, I think I asked you this when we did a, it was like a training for our up-level people. This was a while ago. Mm. Um, but 
how do you recognize if you're a bad coach? Because there's got to be a lot of ego there, right? And, and everyone has ego to a degree. Mm. So how do you objectively look at your performance and identify I'm not as good as I could be? Um, and, and, and really come to some truth of that answer. Because, mm. you know, there's probably a lot of people that maybe aren't the best coach and think they're great. And that's, it's that belief that's holding them back. So how do you identify if you're not good enough? Because it must be quite a hard thing to do, right? Unless someone tells you. I mean, you hit the nail on the head, unless someone tells you. Because you don't know your shit stinks, right? Um, let me give you a story. Last week, I spoke to uh, an ambitious coach who's moving into gym ownership he's been coaching 17 years as a one-to-one -one pt loads of experience super experience i'm his words were i'm really good i'm busy what have you cool i've i've no means to to judge and in any of my sales calls one of my questions will be tell me how much education you've done in the last five years because i need to know how far you've come as a coach or not in the last five years Anyway, and then um, he was like, no, I'm good. And I was like, okay, sweet. And basically his client's giving him a ton of cash to go and open up this gym. And it all sounds really, really attractive, really cool. So then we're looking at the potential model that he wants to create. And it's, it's a little bit of everything. I call it a Franken gym. When you're like, I'm going to do large group and I'm going to do small group and I'm going to have a wellness suite and I'm going to do open gym. And it's like, oh my greatness, like, dude, slow down. And, uh, and then it's like, okay, cool not only do I worry about how well do you understand coaching, but how well do you understand coaching at scale? And how well do you understand coaching at scale that you can coach your coaches that you're going to hire? Because if not, you're going to have to hire a fucking good head coach who's better than you've ever been and you could ever be. And that's going to come at a serious cost. And that's very rare to find. Anyway, um, so I said to him, um, in the anti-pitch because I, I wasn't going to pitch this guy. I was like, dude, truth be told, the only way I can, I'm going to work with you is if um, is if you focus on your education first. Like, I need to upgrade you as a coach. We can do that through the PFCA, after which, um, and as it pertains to the timeline, this works way better, As of, after which, then we can get you onto the mentorship. And he was like, oh, oh but I, I, don't, I don't understand. Like, m my level of knowledge right now is fine. Like, my clients are happy. I'm like, okay, explain that to me. He goes, my clients don't need anything more than what I currently have to offer. And that's the problem is because the, the coach is blind to see what they can do and they devalue what it is that they're doing with the client as well and what they could do with the client. So they just, they just think that, well, my clients are level one. They only want to get to level two out of 10, let's say, and I'm only good enough to take them to level two. And fundamentally, that's where the coaching industry is really, I guess, in a bit of a in a bit of a miss like we we call it a uh, coach's block where like writer's block you go to write a program you're like uh where do i go from here and basically what that is is like most coaches can take on a client take on those first things about what their goals are and maybe write the first 12 week program but then where do i go from here what most coaches do is they show all their shiny tricks whatever they can do in 12 weeks and then they're stuck they have no idea where to take the client from from, like from there to here, they're, they're, they're lost. And it's because of their inability to recognize all the characteristics of things that we could not only enhance during that first 12 weeks, but over the next 12 years, what could you actually do? Like if you genuinely had a client for like the next five years, would you program differently? And the answer would be yes. Would you provide less variety, but have better conversations, drive better autonomy, drive better ownership? Yes, 100%. And so is that consistently trying to frame the next step for the client that you have and having the tools to be able to get them to that next step? It's it's a collaboration between you and the client, yeah. right? So it's this is quite deep, but like a client's goals when they first start, they might be goals that are a projection of what other people are putting on them or what they think they should be doing, right? And your level of conversation skill to be able to or consultation skills, to be able to pull out that in which it re that truly resonates with them and truly is meaningful to them is not yet there. But if that relationship can grow through great conversation, good buy-in, good level of program design and lifestyle design to be able to get the best out of them, if trust starts to form and we can start to unpick that in which they truly value and truly mean, then we can start to move them along that thing a lot further. 
like progression should be a daily iteration of what they're doing. Yeah. All of it is 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 just um you know to quote like atomic habits it's it's, it's just those those little mini like little steps of growth over time, right? But and this is where like true coaching comes into play. It's like when you start to draw that connection and then they can start making better informed decisions on how they can keep growing, then you're just sher- you're just a sherpa. So when they come to you and they go, "Oh, I want to do this thing or I want to be able to achieve this goal." That's when you kind of you're you're you're, you're hitting a sweet spot. Yeah, and 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 you're just having better conversations. Yeah. Right? Like like when <laughs> when you sit down and you 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 consult someone around their goals. Any conversation will be like, okay, so what is it you're trying to achieve? So you get the what. And that's a foundation. The next question that most coaches never ask, and, and this is something we teach at like level three level for our, our students, is like, cool, how do you believe we should get there? I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to coach you. I want you to tell me how do you believe we're going to get there? And it's that question in itself that I can already start to look into your worldview and your perception of how you solve this problem. You know, you might have a client go, yeah, I think uh, I think going keto is the only way I'm going to do this because Jane Jane did keto and she's lost loads of weight. Like, great, now I now I have a starting place to actually have a conversation, right? And then and then and then the top could be like, well, why is this important to you? Or how would this improve your life or whatever, you know? But the, the, like, the bottom is where most people stay. Is like, what? It's like, no, 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 no. It's like it's the how. Yeah. And it's their worldview, their understanding of how they want to solve it. If we can bring those two together, then we're nailing it. I mean, we talk about education is something you do with someone, not to someone. And, and and do you think the business owner of a gym who maybe isn't even coaching on the floor that much should still be educating themselves on coaching, like to this day, even if it's not the primary focus that they do? Like, do you still, um, like, are you still learning on a regular basis when it comes to coaching? Obviously, you don't do any coaching on the floor, right? But is that still something that you practice or or or, or, or learn about? Do you know what? I felt like you were going to ask me this question today. And um, I, I thought about it at length. And I think our situation and our situation is quite unique because of the scale and the levels within the business. Um, but the way I see it is like Alex, Paddy, our head coaches at like our two sites, I need them to be so fucking good at coaching that they can lead their team and drive the coaching standards to a point that either someone in the team outgrows them and therefore they're super mature and they can crack on and keep leading the team and or until well, I don't know when it stops, right? Until someone else comes in and he graduates out of the business. Mm-hmm. But the, the answer is unless you have levels and levels of leadership and management and everything else and you've got someone who's driving the coaching standards, you have to do that. You have to be the driver of yeah. the standards unless there's someone else to drive that who's potentially better than you, potentially. Correct. Yeah. And if you can get the business to be that successful that you can hire that kind of coach, all power to you. That means you've done something really, really special. But most people don't because of many reasons, right? Your personal brand isn't one that comes across as an employer brand. The brand itself doesn't come across as a brand they want to work for. Do you know what I mean? Like a lot of these really high-performing uh, let's call it potential head coaches, they're either going to go and do it on their own or um, not necessarily work for you, but rather work for a much bigger brand. Mm. I, I want to circle back to a question of something you said right at the start, because it's been in my mind. And it's, you mentioned that you've taken on a lot of responsibility in the last year, uh, head of gyms, uh, gym owner network, PFCA, and I'm sure there's other stuff in the mix um, there as well. So there's a lot of responsibility. And you said it's not imposter syndrome, but you have moments where you you know, think and, and potentially what I assume with that, what, what I took from that was poten- potential doubts that come into the mind of everyone. Mm. Now, you're someone that people come to for reassurance when they've got doubts about things and you're a mentor to many. Um, do you ever get those doubts and how do you overcome them? Because I'm sure that everyone has doubts, right, that come into the mind. So do you get them first of all? And how do you overcome those? Absolutely. I think, I think, um, yeah, it's definitely not imposter syndrome, but it's, um, the only way to describe it is I'm so fortunate for the team that I have around me, right? So whether it's Ollie, whether it's Jackson and, and, and other people around that I don't want to, I don't want to let them down. I don't want to let myself down. I don't want to let the team down. And I also don't want to be the one that didn't put a, a W 
on the board at the end of the quarter when we look at the the performance versus targets and actuals. Like, I don't want that. I'm way too competitive for that. So yeah. it's it's kind of all like like uh, I always feel like the the like it's all going to go away tomorrow. Like the carpet's going to get ripped out. It's really insecure, but in a powerful way. And, uh, no, I, know, I, know, I know what you mean, though. You build something big that maybe you never thought it could be. And then you're like, wow, this is this is awesome. But it's also like I've got to keep working on this. Right. Because otherwise it could anything yeah. could happen. Right. hundred percent. And um, one thing one thing that I will never do is sit quietly and be like, I don't know how to do this thing and not ask. Like, yeah. like the one thing I'll always do, despite my ego is I'll ask for advice, I'll pay for advice, I'll pay for help, whatever it is, but I will ask. So the quicker you can, you know, people may have doubts a lot. I don't know how to do this. I'm not very good at this. But the quicker that person goes, I'm not very good at this. Can I get some help? Or where yeah. can I get that help? The, yeah. the, the faster they'll get the answer and the faster they won't have those doubts. Exactly. And I mean, like, for example, we've got this uh, phenomenal ladies coming to the business as uh, MD of SUPS. And her name's Lauren Culvert. And... Um, I'm just a gym guy. Do you know what I mean? I'm just a PT that like slowly done all these other business things, but I'm, that's all I am, right? And uh, she comes from a commercial background and seeing the way she operates and she works a spreadsheet is nothing short of like inspiring. So I'm like sitting to her and I'm going, how you do that? Like that inspires me. I want to be like that. I, I look at her, I'm like, I'm miles away from what she does and how she does it, but I see that as inspiring. And I see that with everyone on the team, like the way, like we talk about capacity, like my capacity for work and, and spinning multiple plates is massive, but it's, it's tiny in comparison to Ollie's. So I look to Ollie for inspiration on how he shows up and what he does. And the same with everyone on the team. And that's the power of, of having the team around us. And it's kind of like feeding off people that are performing at a high level, essentially. Correct. Which is yeah. why people should always look to get help when they when they don't know how to do something, right? Like look at someone who's already doing that or has done it mm. to a much bigger level because mm. they have the answers and the confidence that, that you need. You're kind of borrowing the confidence from someone else, essentially. Exactly, yeah. And I mean, the only thing that gives me like proper anxiety is not growing. So if I get through a week where I've done so much like like fulfillment and work and just like putting out fires or whatever, if by the end of the week I don't feel like I've grown something, I haven't learned something, that's the only thing that gives me anxiety. And what do you do when you've done a week where you've been busy but you haven't? It, it, it will always come back down to, okay, well, what what is like an area in which I need to upgrade my thinking to either help the people on my team or help the business or help uh, the, the clients within the mentorship. And I always, I, that's how I grew my entire coaching skill set was like I would look to the problems I needed to solve that I didn't know how to solve and that would be my next rabbit hole that I'd go down. And like, for example, within the, within the mentorship right now, we, we deliver some really cool education week to week um, within the vault and live calls and whatever. And it's because all we want to do is we just want to upgrade how these guys are thinking because it's, it's, that's the, that's the core difference between someone stuck at 15 to 20 to 25, whatever, whatever that turnover is, it's purely just like how you think, how you operate. Do you think it is mostly mindset and the barriers you place on yourself? <sighs> I think mindset, mindset is all this like soft Instagram post bullshit. Like, I don't think it's that, Yeah. right? I th because mindset today and people's relationship with mindset is like, I don't know, find a good real, good David. David yeah, Goggins I suppose the, the phrase mindset could mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, exactly. inspirational quotes and stuff yeah. like that. I guess, I'm, I guess that, is it the belief system that someone holds that could limit someone or project someone? I think it's... It's a combination of how you think, and that's the only way I can summarize it, but I'll, I'll go into detail. So for example, you lose a client. How do you think, like how do you react in that situation? What is your go-to behaviors? What's your default behaviors in that situation? Is it retreat? Is it anger? Is it panic? Then what are the next steps that you follow thereafter? So, so mindset could be like a, I don't know, some powerful like, just keep going, keep crushing. It's like, okay, cool.
cool. We could do all that motivational bullshit. Or we could go, okay, well, what is that trigger? What is the behaviors that need to now form on the back of that? And that might be system creation, like anything, like anything behavioral wise. What's the system that should that trigger your response, that emotional response be triggered? How can I get you to think differently about that thing? Over time, and this is one of the reasons why, like it's a non-negotiable to track data within the gym owner network, is over time, you know exactly what attrition is where you're performing at and what's normal. So if we're within KPI, it's like, sweet, right? And at the end of the month, we might have a investigation into those five who had left. Where could we have gone better? What could we do? We will have an exit interview to some degree to try and measure any blind spots that we may have had. But the true ability to thrive within business is not is not necessarily mindset. It's like how you think, how you operate. Can you be down with your feet on the ground with your staff, with the product, with the members, but also have this bird's eye perspective on like, yeah, this is within KPI. This is within... Um, reasonable explanation to lose x amount of people based on the way in which we're performing or based on the fact we've got a new staff that we're all trying to onboard whatever now we can we can justify it through proper data rather than just like mindset yeah and then there's a phrase i saw you say recently which is a uh, data over emotion mm. or, or, or is it emotion kills momentum or something along the lines yeah it was there. um emotion kills data builds and uh i will I'd be lying if I said I've had a good relationship with data like my whole career. I definitely haven't. Young gens, 2015, 2016, going into gym ownership. I was a super successful PT, charging more than anyone else. Um, very busy, like 60 hour weeks, all that jazz. Went into gym ownership. Um, beautiful, 1,200 12, 12 square foot. Um, inspired by SNC. A little bit of CrossFit at the time, and then there was this gym in in um, in the states called Tone House, and like all these things influenced what I wanted to build. Anyway, the model was wrong. I I didn't know how to market. I thought if I built it, they would come. They didn't come. Um, nine months in, I hired. Um, I don't know if you remember a guy called Chris Brown. Um, he was a, a marketeer. I hired him, and I did his digital marketing. Uh, mentorship for 12 months and it was I think it was like 1800 quid a month um, it was the biggest investment I'd, I'd ever made into anything like that and I remember learning about marketing and trying to figure out how to run paid ads and all the rest of it and, and that was the first time when I realized like I know nothing about gym ownership I was a good PT a gym owner like this is me as a baby and even then throughout that time the only data that I tracked was a little bit of like paid ads data, nothing else. So I'd be like, oh yeah, um, no one leaves. Like look at our retention, like yeah, everyone's good. But it's like, well, you had eight new members join and you're still at 72 members. You're going nowhere, bro. Like yeah. what, what, what are you not seeing? So it took me, it took me the longest time and uh, so long that it wasn't until, and like I never nailed tracking data as a gym owner and in 2018 i walked away went into education PTing again and then eventually went all in with the pfca and now everything else that you see today and it wasn't until i stepped into my role at march on where i was like unless we have all this data i can't lead this team because you can't make decisions can't make decisions You'd, otherwise you're just guessing right you're mm -hmm. literally just get oh let's try this let's try that yeah I, I spoke with someone today actually and i said oh how many inquiries do you get a month so not just from you know from ads or whatever how many inquiries oh, i don't know we don't track how many signups do you get oh between 10 and 15 but it's like was well, it 10 or is it 15 mm. it's like if you don't have these like most business like the businesses that i see um that are very successful i've not seen one that doesn't track their numbers mm. in, in 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 almost every aspect whether it's from how many inquiries, how many signups, how many left, what the percentage is, what the finances are looking at. Like the best businesses have the best tracking systems. And I speak to so many people more than not that don't track um, the key metrics in their business. And somehow they've managed to get their way to a certain level of revenue, it could be 10, 12, 15K, mm -hmm. but then they get stuck and they don't know what they're doing. And it's the simple boring things that will actually get them there. And yeah. 
hundred percent. I think, you know, f for me, just to go back to the phrase, with data, you can make better decisions. Without data, you're just an emotional mess. So every decision is then fed by emotion. Client leaves you like, oh, we need to do more marketing. Um, you know, uh, and, and, and everything's just like an emotional roller coaster. Good days, bad days. You know, the amount of gym owners that you and I both speak to who have a bad day, who will then bury their head in, their sand, in the sand for multiple months before they come out for a breath and try and make a decision thereafter, which is shocking to say the least. Um, but but if, you, if you truly look at it, any gym owner can actually get to 12 grand a month quite easily. Like you either have it or you don't. If you're stuck underneath 12 grand, I'd, I'd, very, I'd very much question like your capability at all to be able to kick on as a gym owner. Now you might have got your pricing wrong. You might have got the model wrong. In some in, in some um, exceptions, you might just have a really small studio, or whatever. Like you know, you're just a studio owner. But if you get up there, then the only thing that'll take you to where you want to go next is data, because then it's like okay, as you said, well, is it actually twelve? You're getting twelve leads a month. It's like okay, cool, twelve inquiries a month. How well are we converting those leads? Now we know where we can refine. We know exactly what lever it is. You know, I um, I have with good data that as a gym, if you're not getting 30 organic leads a month as a, as a benchmark, your organic efforts are bullshit. So you should be getting a lead a day, basically. A lead a day. And is that through referrals, website, content? A any of those. Yeah. Yeah. If you're not getting a lead a day, you're, you're, you're pissing in the wind. Yeah. And um, even on, like if I take gyms who I've literally gone, the only thing we're gonna focus on is your organic strategy, your product and, and your leadership ability for now. And I've seen how much they've grown over 12 months is just evidence of that. I know a March on gym, it's benchmark for just doing what we normally do, right? Not more, not less, just normally do is 40 leads a month via uh, organic inquiry. and that's like the non-negotiable is like every month we need to get if we drop below that i know that either our time spent was poor maybe maybe non-existent maybe someone changed the the strategy or whatever something's gone rogue mm. but month on month if we're hitting an average of 40 we're there and thereabouts and the efforts that we're doing the things that we're doing are all working if it's not, that's when we investigate. We go, okay, what was it? Have we changed tact? Have we changed message? What do we do wrong here? Because then we can investigate, investigate and go, okay, cool. Weirdly, I don't know why we did that, but let's fix that. Or um, how many referrals did we get this month? Oh, none. Well, what's happened? And that could be a sign of service or, yeah. So, so it leads, so even the inquiries you're getting leads to a potential issue within it could be the product the service or potentially just the organic efforts right exactly like for example now we've we've never had more referrals than we've ever had before at stratford but the product's never been as good as it is now right like i think loads of people forget how important product is and uh referrals albeit unpredictable so you can't 100 percent go yeah, we know we're going to get 15 referrals a month. Like, I know that. However, if you're not getting any referrals, that's a true sign that your product is crap. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's a sign that something's going wrong, essentially, yeah. because you should be getting people talking about you every single month and referring and, and passing something on. Yeah. For sure. Is there a percentage of client to referral you should expect to get? Uh, obviously, you, you there's no you can't control referrals, right? It's not a lever to pull. Mm. In, in some circumstances, it is if you do a a referral campaign. But the the type you're referring to, which is, uh, pardon the pun, um, the type you're referring to is just like people get recommended through the service. Mm. Is there like a benchmark of we've got two hundred clients and from every month I would expect a five percent referral rate or something? Or, or, or does that exist? Or is it just? Do you know what? Uh... I don't have that as a data point. That's that's a good question. Um, but for example, it's it's w it's when and how to ask for a referral. You and I both know there are referral campaigns that you can use as a lever, as and when someone's desperate or all other cards on the table are unable to be played. So it's like okay, we're going to do this campaign as a 
as a Hail Mary to try and get something. But actually, it's the evergreen thing that happens yeah. on a day-to-day -day basis that's a game changer. Like, I'll, I'll share this. It's going to seem extremely um, simple, but so, so, so effective. How you, how you talk about referrals, how you um, reward referrals, and the culture of referrals within your business yes. is the only thing that you need to be doing. So, yes, you can send a gift or you can give, I don't know, money off. I mean, we don't believe in any of that, right? Like, But it's, it's when you refer someone to me, I'm going to put in my comms internally because internal marketing is more important than external marketing. And I'm going to market internally to the community. Hey, guys, just want to give a shout out to Charlie. He's just brought his wife in. So stoked that she's joined the gym. I love the fact that we're growing our community with more like-minded like people. Big up, Charlie. Yeah, it's um, I, lo I love that of building the referral culture. You know, the moment someone comes through the door, like, do you, do you talk about referrals, recommendations, you know, the impact that it can have? There's a client of ours, uh, Ben Rooney. Now, I know you mentioned that um, the money off thing, but what he does is he gives a uh, hundred pound cash and then he gets a photo of the client and they've got their hundred pound and they've got like a, a little gift and then it goes on socials and then that person will share it there. So it's just that sort of mini reward for when someone gets a referral. Mm -hmm. Um, and it also kind of showcases that people are recommending. And um, I just thought that was a real nice touch in terms of being able to reward and showcase that and kind of have up the water cash there. And it kind of looks looks quite good there. So I definitely agree with that uh, referral um, culture. That the you only mentioned. thing I challenge there is I never want anything to feel transactional. Yeah. So, um, and this is how we do everything within business. Our partnerships, our relationships, is that everything should feel trans transformational rather than transactional. Yeah. So if you're only, only going to send me someone because I'm going to give you 100 pounds cash versus you're going to send me someone because you truly believe in the product and you think that this could change their life, what would you rather have? Do you know what I mean? Like genuinely. And like, so for us, it's more about like at what stage are you asking for referrals? And that's probably the best tip for gym owners listening today is like don't ask for referrals just anytime you can. That's like the desperate guy at 2 a.m. on the club floor just trying to figure out what he can get. It's like, no, 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 Like, as a client's achieving great things and you're building rapport, like let's say at the end of a onboarding phase, a six-week challenge, and they've crushed it and they've converted to a member, that's a great time to ask. Or at a check-in point, a client review session, and they're crushing it, they're hitting their goals, that's the time to ask. It's not just whenever or all the time. It's at the right time. Yeah. Right. So you want to nurture those conversations. And and then as you reward that culture, it just happens by proxy anyway. Yeah, for sure. So when we find uh, what's quite nicely is like a is like a seasonal uh, referral. Mm. So um, a lot of people may do this and like Christmas cards out and there's like a, a nice gift that can be a stocking filler. We find that works quite nicely because it's more of just like a gift mm. that can be given out. So it kind of works there. But I definitely um, agree with what you say about the culture, the service, and that flow of organic referrals that come through without having to pull a lever. Mm. Um, because you should, every business should strive to have that where you'll, you get referrals without having to ask them. And that should be like a baseline yeah. that, that takes place there for sure. You spoke about leadership um, earlier on, and that's like a big factor of what you help people with uh, within the network. And I, I've heard you say a number of times, you know, it's not about just reading, you know, the leadership book or listening mm. to the Jocko Willick pod mm. podcast or something like that, right? So what, is I was thinking about this question and I was thinking it might be quite stupid to ask, but what what is leadership? Now that, now that seems so simple and so some people are like, well, uh, but like what what is that to you? Oh, this is such a good question. Um I got it I got it wrong when I was a gym owner because I was when I was first a gym owner because I I'd set up the model wrong. I didn't employ my staff. So I had I had set like I had freelance trainers in there trying to fulfill class times and all the rest of it. And I, I got it all wrong. And um it wasn't until um back in the day with IFBA and what JC was doing with W ten and saying employee coaches, 
Ollie started working with JC to get behind this like employed thing and actually build a business and it became like, okay, no, that's the right step to go. And um, I remember I had employed someone and I couldn't get the best out of this person and she had churned out of the business. And I took it, I took it so personally because I was like, what am I doing wrong? Like I was like the captain of most rugby teams I played in like most like like leadership was something that came naturally to me surely like I'm, I'm a natural born leader surely this should just like just should happen and it wasn't the case it wasn't the case and I remember um, I remember then going down a journey of education around leadership courses um, mindset courses all these different things because I I felt truly like insecure about or imposter syndrome about like how good or not I was as a leader anyway um over the years you know he grew into this role and I remember just before we hired Caroline um who's my head of ops for PFCA and gym owners and shout out to Caroline she's an absolute rock star um I don't know how we survive without her but um I was proper nervous before she came onto the team, like proper nervous. And was that because you had someone that left beforehand? Um, so that person who left beforehand, that was uh, that was my gym owner days. So that okay. was like a, a, while, a while ago, yeah. Now Caroline's been with us two and a half, uh, two years. And two years ago, before she joined the business, I was proper nervous. Because I was like, because now was the first time because I was looking after indirectly a lot of the coaches on on the March on team alongside me and all just growing the PFCA and, and and what have you, but now taking on Caroline as employee number one for the PFCA, I was proper nervous because I was like I don't want to I don't want to fuck this up, like the stakes are high, she's super valuable, um, how can I get the best out of her, and one of my really close friends she's um she's a top 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 leadership coach. Um, I'm talking like levels, like she, she's in charge of a, a, a huge, uh, international medical, um, company, pharmaceutical company, and she's the leadership coach to the international sales directors to help them be better leaders to their team. So she's like, she's, she's proper, proper top dog. And I was like, Katie, I'm nervous. How am I going to get the best out of like her? What can I do as a leader? Like, like, what am I missing? So she ran a personality type test with me and with her, and she sat me down and she she showed so you me. You then Caroline. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And she showed me Caroline's personality type and how she wants to be communicated and how well she would respond to things versus my style. And she was like, "This is how you're going to have to adapt to this and what have you." And it was like it was a game changer. That is, yeah, that's that's really good. And do you get gym owners to do that as well? The yeah. personality style yeah. test? Yeah, so we, we now do it like, we do it when we take on clients onto gym owner network so that we know how we can better communicate with you. So like, for example. That's so good. I'm a, I'm a big picture guy. Mm. So if you, if you say to me, let's go create a course, in my head, I see everything. The course, the chapters, everything. I see it, you don't need to tell me that. But Caroline's a detailed person. Mm. So I need to say to her, hey, we want to create a course. This is the title of the course. These are the modules. These are the subsections in the modules. This is the intent of each module. This is how it's going to look. This is when we're going to shoot it. Like she needs every freaking piece of detail. Otherwise, she'll feel overwhelmed and completely check out. And so if she doesn't have the detail and you're trying to run with something without providing the detail or giving her the information to find that, that's going to cause distress exactly. for her. Yeah. So that was the first time I truly realized that actually I wasn't necessarily the problem as a leader, but what I wasn't doing was treating leadership as coaching. So to go back to your question, what is leadership? And leadership for me is, is a couple of things. What, like the, the, the navigating people out of a, navigating a company out of a phase of um, uncertainty, that's leadership, right? Where you can see a path out of the out of the storm and no one else can. That's leadership, and it's like, it, like, I take full ownership whether this works or not. But this is the way we're going. So I think that's that's leadership in one in one setting. 
then all the other things that happen like from you down to the team is part leadership, part coaching, part mentorship, part delegation. So for example, I struggled to get my intuition out onto paper to lead others. And that's what most, most gym owners can't do that. Because it's like, I've got all these good ideas, I've got these good instincts on how I handle it, but how do I create an SOP around it? You say SOP to a gym owner, they're like, no, I'm not gonna do that. I mean, just use ChatGBT. It's like, help me create an SOP for what to do when an inquiry does this, this, this. Sends it, you either agree or don't, change it, and then it helps you, right? But um, it, it was, it was realizing that there's different levels and different things that people need underneath you to be able to help and facilitate them so that they can know how they can win at their job. So every book you read about leadership, it almost gives you these like airy fairy approaches. Because it's, but it's their approach mm. to a situation which isn't relevant to potentially your personality type or their personality type. So you may pick up a certain mm. behavior type that doesn't, it's like a jigsaw piece that doesn't match the, the whole. Yeah. and. Uh, on a big corporate level, there's things that can happen on a corporate level from an organizational structure. And, and at, at that scale, yeah, it kind of makes sense. But in a gym where it's so intimate, the conversations, the time around each other, we're spending time socially on the weekends, like it's it's hard, right? So how do we get this right? And the, the biggest thing that I've helped a lot of gym owners realize is delegation equals what is it? How do we do it? And what's the meaning? That's what delegation is. Then it's them taking this thing, doing it together. So we'll do it together. Then you'll then this person can either run with that or go, I can do this differently. Let me let me have a go at this thing differently. Where most gym owners go wrong is they think delegation is one, they don't do it because they don't want to let go, or two, they let go of things that they hate, but they just throw it on and say, You do it. But the thing that sits in between that whole thing is like, okay, well, what is it? How do we need to do it? And what does it mean to the business? So if I'm going to delegate, let's say sales, right? I need to know how do we do sales? Like, why do we do sales? <laughs> why do we sell this way? What's the meaning of selling this way? And how will it pertain to you, to your role, to the business, to the culture, everything? Cool, do we understand all that context? And it's it's that which I can I can give you multiple different examples of of that across the board. It's that amount of time that gym owners aren't spending with their staff, and yet they wonder why their staff aren't succeeding at their role, because they aren't dedicating the time to nurture someone, to mentor someone, to coach someone, right? So leadership for most of the people listening today is not what they read in a book. Leadership for most of the most of them is like. Try be the mentor that you wish you had when you were trying to learn how to do the thing you're doing. Yeah, I think that's great. Try be the mentor you wish you had. I really like that. And uh, going back to your personality type and Caroline's, how do you actually, you know, let's say she needs the details. You're not someone that you, you see it in your head and um, but struggle to put it out onto paper. How, how do you find that balance now? Because that's me completely. I'm not detail orientated. And there's definitely times in the office where I might rub someone up the wrong way, but because I've got the ideas, yeah. but then the detail doesn't come. Um, it's like, in my opinion, the more I can adapt to her style so that she can run with it and I don't need to keep going back and forth, the better. So do you have to kind of force yourself to 100%. work in that as the leader, you've got to force yourself to give them what they need to succeed. Exactly. Essentially. Yeah. So that so that if I do it right once, then it's done. Yeah. Because otherwise what tends to happen, you did it wrong the first time. Then you go back and you try and iterate and again and again and it's super inefficient. So yes, you might have a style and that's how you want to operate, but all the people around you, for them to succeed, you're gonna have to adapt to that in which empowers them the most. So like all the amazing people that I have, I guess, direct, I don't know, responsibility with or for whatever, I literally have to be someone different to each and every one of them. It's crazy, but it's great fun. Like 
Caroline compared to Mass, compared to Matt, compared to Alex, compared to Patty, compared to Katie. It's all completely very, very different. But it's that's that's where I get the most like kick out of what I do. Because like Coach Jens as a, an identity, for the longest time it was personal training and it was like SNC and it was like weight loss and fitness and mindset. And then it's like the educator. Now where I see myself is like it is it's always been this thing where it's like I I have a superpower of getting the best out of you. And that's my superpower. What once was fitness is now through business, through work, whatever it is. I love the I love the coaching aspect that I have to bring to each and every one of my people to the place where how can I get them to become the best of what they do? So that when they leave and they will leave at some point, that they leave in a better place than when they came in. All right, and, and, and we owe it to our team to be able to do that. And with these people that you're leading, there's two in particular that now run each gym. You've got uh, it's Alex at Harpenden mm. and Paddy at Stratford. Mm. And they essentially like, they're kind of like the gym manager, let's say. Mm. They are in charge of that gym. You are in charge of them. So mm. they are responsible for the day-to-day -day and everything happens there. And mm. there's a lot of people listening thinking, where do I get my kind of right-hand man, gym mm. manager that can run the show while I can step away from even more and focus on other things. And that's quite a hard thing to do, right? To completely step a, away from the business or a step away a lot from the business. So I guess my first question is, is where does the business need to be, first of all, for you to be in a position to start that process of vetting someone and building them up to be essentially you, you know, the, the take that kind of ownership role where does the business need to be first of all before that process starts taking place? Because I imagine some people try too early and they give it to someone, they give it to them badly, they take their eye off the ball and the gym goes into a bad place. So what's that first step or, 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 or where does the gym need to be, would you say? That's a really good question. And I, I want to answer in a way that is most useful without being too vague, but also it's hard without a it depends right like one thing we say in our education is we'll never answer student back with it depends yeah we'll try to give all the contextual pieces of of the of the potential solution it's always hard because you've got so many people listening right mm. so it's hard to give one answer for for me if we look at like okay if, if, if we look at like one of the biggest problems gym owners face today is the how much they struggle to hire good coaches how hard it is to find good coaches. So like one of the things that we're super proud of at the PFCA is not only are we educating through the best coaching syllabus there is at the moment, so we're, we're making better qualified coaches, but with the network and the influence and whatever, we can deploy some of these coaches into great establishments where gym owners are have good intention to be able to facilitate the growth and the development of these young coaches. I mean, hell, I wish there was what my, I mean, yeah, I wish like my first three years was a paid internship type role where you're getting paid to learn and coach. Like how sick would that have been? And so many of the gym owners we look after, they feel so proud of the fact that, that, that they get to do that role for others, okay? So, so number one is where they're gonna get coaches from, okay? So if they're only f if they're only fishing fishing from their little pond, and they're finding it really hard to even find anyone that aligns to their values or the values of the business and and all the rest of it, then the next thing is like, well, where is this business going to attract more talent or better talent, or is it just the fact that you're going to be so good at breeding them through your your system? So that that question of where does the business need to be. It definitely reflects a level of uh, sophistication based on the brand, the product, and what it looks like as maybe a employer brand, okay? However, if you wanna attract a right-hand man, which is really, really hard, and this is why so many go into a business with a business partner, because it, it feels easier and we could share the load. But if you're gonna attract that, 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 that person, they're likely crushing it as a PT. They're making good money anyway. So you're gonna to have to be able to pay them a very, very attractive salary that speaks to their financial needs, 
speaks to their professional needs and their goals and their aspirations and makes them feel part of something really meaningful and special. Now that part of something meaningful and special might look like the team aspect and being part of a team, but also, and more importantly, is this brand cool? Is this brand cool and is it something I really want to represent? You know, we, we're we working closely with um, some great gyms, one one who we share as, as a client, um, Fionn, Fionn and Gavin. And one of the words I said to him was, you're never going to grow this business until we fix what the brand looks like and what these, what these gyms feel like. And some people wouldn't think that that's about staffing, right? Like people wouldn't put those two things together, mm. branding and staff. But actually, it does play a much bigger role than most people think. 100%. Like, <laughs> Fionn, if you're listening to this, I love you, bro. Um, I literally said their uniform looks like PE teachers at a really bad school. I was like, from the uniform to the brand to how they show up, everything, it just it just needs to exude something that's like aspirational and cool and they like want to represent. You know, the power of March On is the culture that Ollie's created and the fact that people care about representing the badge on their chest rather than the name on their backs. And if we can get more gym owners to be able to create that kind of like environment, then it's, then it's really special. Rather than like a gym owner who only cares about himself or, or herself and has these freelance PTs who are essentially tenants in their gym and they, they, they have to fend for themselves as long as the gym owner is fine, he's fine. He or she is fine. So it's kind of like, yeah, you've got these self-employed people where they've got their best interests at heart. The business owner's got their their own interests at heart. So no one's really kind of caring for each mm. other, right? Whereas this kind of person that could uh, be a, the manager, the leader, you've got to really put care into them, you know, financially, education-wise for, for them to want to put care into you and what you do, right? 100%. And the the short minded nature of that is like how much money can we make and how little can it cost me to make x amount of money but then at some point you realize that that's broken and what you really want is a team that you you know the freelance pt doesn't want to stay behind 3 4 hours a week to work on cohort management at risk reports pro, um program sessions they don't like unless you pay me my 50 pound i don't want to be here right so the the alternative and and tom and chloe shared this recently on one of our podcasts was they love the fact that they're paying um their coaches a good salary that one of their coaches now for the first time can go away with his family he's getting paid paid holiday he's got nothing to worry about doesn't have to worry about how many clients he's going to lose or whatever he can go he can be present with his family and come back to work and everything's going to be fine and they've been able to create an environment where that's safe and that's okay. And someone who is a PT, it's going to be very hard for them to want to leave now to, because they're in that environment, right? They've yeah. got a lot of certainty where they can do what they love, help people, get paid, have holiday with the family. Not many PTs can say they do that because obviously you go away for a week and you, you, you take a financial hit, most people that are self-employed, right? Mm. Yeah, massively. I mean, that's so special. And if, and if as an employer, you're investing time, money, effort into their development, their growth, professionally, personally, financially. It's its a magical place to be a part of. And so that role of that kind of leader within the gym, the manager, whatever, you, head coach, mm. whatever you want to call it, what would their roles and responsibilities be? Or does it kind of depend on, on the situation and their strengths and what they don't like? But, um, you know, let's uh, look at an example of, you know, um, Alex at your gym, um, what is he, what are his roles and responsibilities within that position? Mm, yeah, so <clears throat> from um from a march on gym standpoint, one of our things that we're trying to really nail at the moment is as we're opening up multiple sites, we're trying to nail a, a much more of a consolidated, strategic head office type feel that then really facilitates how well all the other teams can operate and perform. But if we look at it as a snapshot of Alex's responsibilities, it'll be like we'll set we'll set targets for the quarter as it pertains to members, as it pertains to um, 
Well, well, I mean, the byproduct of hitting all the other KPIs will be the members at the end of the quarter. That's the target. He's responsible for that to happen. Then how he then manages his time based on that will be um, indicative at the end of the quarter whether it was effective or not. So, for example, if he comes in and he goes, okay, a big focus is retention. It's like, cool, let's see how well you can utilize your time to improve retention or whatever else, right? And there's th those core KPIs that really matter. So it sounds like he's given quite a lot of autonomy 100%. to uh, plan what he's going to do within that week. And as long as the KPIs are where they need to be, then great job. Correct. And like, like I will set the KPIs, but I will have Alex present me his thought of how of what the KPI should be and we'll compare notes so I can help him better see the performance of the gym through my eyes and his eyes right so it's not me just spoon feeding but it's me like driving a high level of conversation so like for example um, we we will come up with the marketing strategy of what it is we're doing but the practice of it in the day to day, like crack on, I, like I don't care when you do it, I just want it done. I don't care how you do it as long as we get our 40 leads a month via organic streams. And they're responsible for that avenue as well in terms of the marketing from the organic standpoint. Yeah. So, yeah. so they're responsible for the social page for um, for, for the Harpenden side. Yeah. Because like if we look at Instagram as a funnel, for example, what we're doing on the grid versus what we're doing on stories is two very different things. And the 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 type of people, people who are watching the stories versus going on the grid are two very different people, two very different buyer types. But if there's one thing that we do better than anyone else is we tell a great story through Instagram stories in a way that really captures attention, pulls you along on the ride, builds trust, builds authority. Any break of routine always intrigues a little response. Hey, are you okay? Or where are you? Or what's going on? It's that goggle box type documentation. It's like, it's game changing. I need my teams to be able to facilitate that every day. Patty came to me when we launched Stratford Instagram page. And I was like, oh, we'll do like two or three stories a day. And I was like, bruv, 15 stories a day minimum. Because if we're not telling a story of what we're doing to, to a degree of 15 or more, you're not taking anyone on a journey. You're not giving them enough BTS to be able to be truly like... In. Connected, mm. yeah. That kind of behind the curtain look at what's Correct. going on at the gym. Yeah. And would you say, is there like a different style at Harvard and to what there is Stratford, depending on their personalities? Yeah, yeah. Because uh, through stories, I want personality to come like really shine through. Our intentions of what we're going to be doing with the grid uh, for the gyms is going to change over the next um, two to three months as we look to increase production level, in increase like time and, and resource spent on that from a grid standpoint. But stories, stories where is where like connection really happens. So how well can you connect the dots for 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 the new voyeurs? And so they're responsible for uh, the leads, the the retention rate. The, the the front end sales yeah and um all the other metrics that come with the gym and you are responsible for getting them to hit those metrics essentially Correct. yeah um and i saw a video you were doing a one-to-one -one, uh with alex what, mm. what what's the cadence of that meeting like so uh for for the best part of about i think 11 months last year that was weekly because of the intensity that was required for me to be involved with him so we could review how well he's spending his time, how well was his time spent in putting scores on the doors, how could I mentor him to be more effective, what have you. Eventually, that then grew to now once a month because, like I said previously, like it's how can we drive any relationship, any relationship with any coach-client relationship to a high, high degree of autonomy. So now we'll meet once a month. We will, and, and this is our framework of, of like meeting structure for any one-to-one, -one. You start off with the values. So it's like, how are you performing against the values? Number one, really, really important. The power of having really good values, and this is something that um, Danny Wicks, uh, one of our uh, board of advisors, had shared with us and taught us, is when leading a team through values, 
it puts the values as the filter in which I'm going to measure your performance and you're going to measure your own performance. So ours for like the whole kind of umbrella is live, learn, lead. And the substantiation of each one of those is quite profound and we all understand what that means, what it means to us, what it means to the business, how we show up, etc. So if I, if you and I had a one-to-one -one right now and I said, cool, um, how are you? A score out of 10 and you'd be like, yeah, I'm, I'm an eight or I'm a nine or I'm a six, things at home aren't great, cool. Like, I, like that's a check-in. And it's like, okay, great. First things first, let's look. How are you performing against live? And then you will almost self-regulate um, or self-assess how you're performing against that thing. Then, the, you know, live, learn, lead. And we'll do those three things. And already through that, I have such a good place to be able to now have a conversation with you. Even before they dived into the metrics. Correct. And is that... Is, is a reason why because let's say they're saying they're having a hard time at home mm. for, for whatever reason but then show you some metrics that maybe aren't where they need to be but because you've checked in with them as a person there's a level of understanding of what's going on um to for you to be like okay this isn't where it needs to be i understand this because of this or is there is this like no tolerance to the kpi not being met or, or does it give you that understanding you need mm. If something is not going well at home, let's say, I think that's just like an episodic thing that's happening. I don't don't think that's like, it's not like a zero tolerance. We're just like perform, performance, performance, performance. If it's something that is not an episode, it's a chronic thing that's not changing, then, then we need to have interventions to try and either overcome it or what have you. I think what's more important is if someone doesn't hit a KPI that we said we'd hit, and we we as a team, as like the head coaches, we meet every week. Uh, we call it a performance huddle, where we look at how many leads came in via paid, how many leads came in via organic, how many front end offers did we sell, how many referrals did we get, um, how many conversions did we hit, what conversions, who converted at what level, or how many opportunities are in the pipeline this week. How many levers and basically those are all categorized in a color scheme based on target um, weekly it's a problem or there's a huge issue there's something not working here that in itself gives us enough cadence week to week to actually know what we're doing that monthly review we know everything that's going on from a number standpoint it's more like how do you feel you're performing in your role what support do you need how can i either coach you through maybe some kind of a mental block or some kind of a limiting belief or what behavior have you maybe adopted or, or let slip in that's allowed you to underperform or think differently. So it comes back to what I said about how you think. It's like, how can we now at the end of the month recalibrate how you're thinking going forwards? So already through the values, lead might be one of them and you're not, you haven't invested the time you needed to with the two junior coaches and you're frustrated by how they're underperforming on the gym floor you've already told me exactly what's wrong you've already told yourself exactly what's wrong i don't need to do anything here. i'm just facilitating a conversation where you're taking an honest reflection on your performance and we're going to make interventions that are going to try and facilitate the change going forwards and it kind, of, it kind of goes back to data right the more information you have the more you can realize what's actually going on because if you just went straight to the kpi without asking any of those questions doesn't really it, 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 you then have to do even more work to figure out where where the issue is essentially yeah but it just gives you more data points to work off so you you asked me a question a second ago where it was like is it like no tolerance what we have zero tolerance for is not reporting the data so so if it, so i i run re my report at 5 30 a.m on a monday morning that's when i run where i get everyone's data and i put it in my report and i submit my report to the leadership team if come Monday morning it's not there, like you're in fucking trouble because now I can't do my job, the team can't align, we can't make interventions to try and, because if there's an issue, we need to solve it. And if we now have a delay in this process because you didn't deliver on that one thing, that's a non-negotiable, zero tolerance kind of bull thing. And you've obviously got the leadership team, you've got everyone else. So if one person isn't, 
passing on the data that stops everything and there's that there's real pressure to make sure you do that right because right. you are letting someone else down and there's a lot a lot of social pressure there if you're a gym owner and you are the boss and there's no one else to report to it's almost easier to let yourself down right and is that where you feel the gym owner network comes in in terms of a lot of hard questions a lot of hard truths that come in there do you make them do you make the gym owner clients report data to you yeah, so within within the network, it's a non-negotiable around data because um, it's it's going to be the thing that's going to allow us to have far more sophisticated conversations that are going to get you the result that you're investing for. So right? it's, it's zero tolerance to not reporting the data 100%. when 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 they work with you guys. Yeah, I mean you've been in the room where you know bullshit was shared that they weren't doing it yeah there was um i was so i, ca I came to one of your board, boardroom events and I, and I sat at the back and just chatted with a few people we got some clients that uh, are both with us and yourself and there was um there was a client that was told to do something six weeks prior and they hadn't and i think the words you said were like if you if you don't if, if you don't do like if you do this again you're out and it was like really plain and simple because it was very simple tasks for that person to do but they hadn't done it and i guess it kind of comes down to that if, if you don't have the data, if they don't have the data, they're not going to get to where they want to go. So they have like, you're, 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 you're killing your own growth by not doing this. And I only want people that want to grow in this room. That's kind of what it said to me. Yeah, 100%. And, and more importantly, you want to grow as well. And the reason why you're not growing is because you like the way you're thinking and the way you're operating. So get out of your own way. And just like, like, if you need to be do what you're told and do do so far too many um, gym owners, um like uh, here's a better analogy we treat all the gym owners within the gym owner network as if they were representing a march on gym in that territory and if they take that level of responsibility now it's not just for themselves but actually shit they've got to really show up because otherwise they'd be fired they'd lose their gym like if you raise that level of of accountability or raise the stakes that high everything changes but for most of them, it's kind of shit that they didn't hit the leads, but it doesn't matter. The gym's not going to close tomorrow, right? Because the stakes aren't high. It's only when it's only when there's a gun against your head that you fucking show up and do something. And you actually start doing the work that you yeah. don't want to do. Yeah. Like we, we share a client, um, Farah, and uh, she was she was with the mentorship. She was doing some of this, um, some of the things that. Um, I had shared from a strategic standpoint to change the model. She had got it all in and then she had shared one day, it's like, this isn't working. Like, you know, I'm not getting the leads. Um, FMA campaign isn't working. Uh, the model's wrong. We shouldn't have done it, whatever. And I called her up and I said, show me the data. Show me the data. I was like, bullshit. You're complacent and you need to step the fuck up. Because right now you're just sitting there blaming everyone else and not looking at yourself. And so was the reality that she had, you know, probably ha had enough leads to make sales, probably wasn't, you know, maybe put in reps initially, but but it's because it go back to a past time when there was the gun against the head mentality, you're gonna make this work. Yeah, you know? you know what happened after that conversation? She had then found out she was pregnant and she's already got one kid under two and she's a single mom. Now the stakes are high. Now she has to show up. In that subsequent month, she made 31 sales at a price point she had never, ever thought possible. Wow, amazing, smashed it. And also congratulations, because um, yeah. I think she's had a baby uh, a, f a few weeks back yeah. as well. Yeah, absolutely, congratulations. And, she, and, and she's a perfect example of that complacency level where actually it's just the stakes. It's just how you perceive the stakes. So accountability is more like, like like for me and 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 you know what we spoke about earlier around the leadership team i don't want to got, come to a leadership meeting and having not put a w on the board or not have a solution to change where we currently are or 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 just underperform right and the accountability of being able to contribute as a team is really important um and that's what we want for all the members in in the gym and the network is we want them to feel like the stakes are so high and the moment they realize that, I cannot tell you the shift in mentality, the shift in performance, everything. It's incredible. The one thing that um, we keep sharing today, which is, I think, really interesting for the listeners is the sooner you move away from thinking that this is a family, this, this gym unit, this team of yours, 
to actually just being a team and you treat it like a high performance team, the better. So when you spoke about like if someone didn't report how much it affects everything else, it's a bit like in a rugby team. If if I pass you the ball, I need to know that you you know your role. You're either passing it on to the next person into space or you're gonna you're gonna run it forwards. Or if we're in a defensive line, like you know the Springboks have one of the best defensive lines. Is like okay, well we know that I trust the guy on the left and my right explicitly to do his role. Right. And that's what that's what this whole team thing is about. Well, I wanted to ask that, actually, because when you said you have these meetings where you're checking in, are they matching up with uh, like uh, live uh, and it was there and, and um, uh, lead. And what, what was the other one? Sorry. Live, learn and lead. Live, learn and lead. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a chance to check in with them personally. Where where should people draw the line between you're a team member um, professionalism, but also the level of care, because I think in some places, especially when it's a small operation, the personal can cross over into the professional. Mm. Uh, and because it's a small team and a small business, some people do think like, oh, we're mm. a big happy family, right? And obviously you want to care about people, but it's also got to be kept professional. So, so I, and I imagine some people do cross over in those marks. So how, how, how do you keep a, a boundary while still, you know, caring, caring for the team essentially? Yeah, this is a, such a good question. And, um, the the best solution that you could possibly grab uh, right now is to formalize your meeting structure, formalize a meeting cadence, and have formal one-to-ones. So that we know that we're gonna have this meeting, it's going to be formal, it's going to be professional, it's gonna be purely based on the data, rather than like, we're having a chat while going for a coffee, while talking about marketing, or talking about sales, or talking about the weekend, and it's all just a blur. So if you, like like something that we teach within the Gemini Network is, what meetings to hold when, what's the agenda for each meeting, how do you show up, how much preparation do you take prior to that meeting, how much do they need to prepare in order to show up to that meeting, all, like a meeting's only as good as its preparation. But then when we have that meeting, We both know that we're having a very professional conversation as it regards to the agenda, to your role, to the vision of the business, the goals of the business, et cetera. Without the formal sit down, it all becomes a blur. And like within within all the March on PFCA stuff, we've got that nailed with the coaching team, we've got that nailed with some of the verticals around the marketing team, whatever. But there's also some conversations that happen because we're so close and because we're just moving so fast that actually some of those conversations are best had in the formal one-to-one setting. So it's, it's, it's a discipline that is extremely hard to truly maintain, but it's one that if you do, especially in an intimate team, it changes the, it changes the game because then when you have that chat, it feels more formal and it draws, it draws a boundary. So, 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 the, so the answer is kind of to, to set the formal intention before the meeting takes place, rather than like should we go for a for, for a chat exactly. or a sit down. It's like we're going to have our one to one review, and then this we're going to go in there. And then obviously, if someone does spill something, you're, you're still in the confines of a one to one review, and that yeah. kind of sets the tone. And most people should understand those tones and would will release a certain amount of information based on the setting that they're in. Yeah, and and you know, if if we want to go down that route of like if it becomes a conversation around the personal. Right, and they share something, and it might be a valid reason for underperformance. Like that's why you do it, because otherwise, what tends to happen is they don't have a chance to communicate with you. You don't give them an opportunity to do so. You start seeing them underperform one week, two week, four weeks, six weeks, three months, and you're like, "What the fuck is wrong with you?" Like, and then you start to resent them. Then you talk about them behind their back, and then all of a sudden, they feel alienated and they leave, or you kick them out. And that's all from not having those conversations. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. And we've talked, spoken about, you know, that, that leadership role in the gym, but you've also got a salesperson mm. um, who, is a, who, who, who is very good um, at sales. And I know that's a thing that a lot of people potentially want to do where it's get a salesperson. But again, they might not be at the right stage to get a salesperson. They might just hate sales mm. um, and not be good at it. And I personally believe that you should, as you said earlier, you should know how it works and know how to do it before you pass it on. Mm. It's like, yeah, you should you should have a level of competence at something before you delegate it. Even if you really don't like it, as a yeah. business owner, you should learn to 
get to a level at it, even if you're not going to be a, a pro. But what stage do you think that a, a gym owner should be at before they get a sales um, member of team, if one at all? And then what, what does that onboarding process look like for you? Because a lot of people talk about it's hard to hire a coach. Mm. It's hard to hire a salesperson mm. and keep that person there for a long time. Because mm. in the world of sales, people jump from ship to ship, mm. right? Because it's a, it's a very volatile game. When it comes to selling like gym memberships, you, you know, you, you could do it in your sleep now. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Um, and coaching others, I've, I've done it, you know, to many and like the principles all there. And, and then bringing Katie on board, very sophisticated as a salesperson, incredibly talented, but selling gym memberships uh, is very, very difficult. And she actually, how, how we first got to meet her, she did our level three course because she was going to go into running her own, her, own, her own business. So she's done our PT qualification. So she, she's got a bit of coach in her. And the first few levels of her sales conversations when reviewed, she went way too coachy now that she'd unlocked coach. I was like, no, 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 no. I just need you to sell. Like, like just get direct. Like, let's go. And um, it's something that we don't yet have figured out but I have every trust in her that she's the person for, for the job. And the reason why we've brought her now into the business is for the ambitions of where we're taking the business and the multiple sites and everything else. I, I firmly believe that the gym owner has to make the sales and then the gym owner, maybe one or two others on the team could make sales. And then it comes a point in the business where the gym owner has to look at what areas does he want to delegate and what does he feel comfortable delegating? And that's going to be fed on the people in the team, their skill sets, their capabilities, their interests, as well as um, what do they enjoy, what they don't enjoy, et cetera, et cetera. So, so for me, march on gyms going forwards. I want coaches to have the skill set to sell, but those sales conversations are going to be regarded to conversions and retention, not necessarily front end sales. But then I just want them to coach. I want them to be the best coaches, like literally the industry's best coaches. I don't want to spread them all the way thin across all different things. Yeah. How, however, we needed them to all sell to get us to where we are now. So when you ask that question, it's like, well, I think a multiple gym operator, you can centralize that and make it a lot easier. And yes, you can have you can have a, a salesperson deal with that thing. That's my current perception of the with the information I have now. But in a small site growing to probably 40, 45 grand months, like you can leverage everything within your team to be kind of good at everything. You won't be you you won't have the best coaches, you won't have the best sales team, you won't have whatever, but you you've got kind of enough of the things to be able to allow you to to grow the business. And are you guys at one call closing, all the people now? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, did, you, did you guys used to do consultations back in the day or in, in the early days of Harpenden or was it always? In the beginning, when um, Alex was first getting on sales calls, it was his safety blanket to try and bring them in for a, for a consult. And, and obviously you guys are very, very um, big on the one call close. Um, and I think you and I can both agree that the the consult method is one that the the baby salespeople they revert back to or they jump onto because that's their their comfort zone. Yeah. Because they they know coaching, so if they can get them in front of them to coach, then um, then they can do some good things. But yeah, it's, it's it, I think the one call close is is definitely an area that people can lean into more and more but it's just a recognition of the skill set required to truly be able to sell yeah um, and, 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 and i agree like i personally think that the one will close is the most effective way to sell time wise roi wise on the time you're spending but you know you should never just have one route if someone does want to come and see the gym that's not a problem uh, mm. for me by any means but uh, there's people now and um, that you know, they think they sell a, a, high, a high premium price and they think they need to have a consultation process. But what what what, what are the rates at Harpenden? 
Uh, upwards of 350 to 500. Yes, and that's been taken over the phone, right, with a 15-minute mm. conversation. So just some encouragement to anyone listening that is still doing a consultation that thinks that people need to come in. Uh, they really don't. It is, I, I, I would firmly believe it's, it's, it's a belief system within your mindset that is holding you back rather than the reality of the marketplace right now. Yeah, I think uh, Matt Connolly in our team, he says, uh, anything under 10,000 pounds is a one call close. Otherwise inefficient. I like that. I'm a big I'm 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 a big fan of that there. Yeah. So Jim and a network, I think you guys have you're working like well over a hundred people now. Like you've had huge growth in a short space of time helping people. Um what would you say are the biggest things that people come to you and you just identify this needs changing, this needs fixing? Like what are the most common I guess like red flags you see in most gyms um, when they when they come through because I'm sure you have clients I'm sure you see common themes now and they say mm. a certain phrase and you kind of in your head go there we go I know I know where this is going uh, without being offensive to you guys <laughs> um, the gym owner says I need more leads yeah that's obviously hilarious because like do you really need more leads or do you want more clients yeah and do you want more clients or do you need a better team do you need whatever whatever so yeah no, I, I i agree i think i think people aren't closing enough of the inquiries that mm. they have people's conversion rates aren't high enough like within mm. the gym industry mm. um you know i was speaking to someone yesterday that um they that, that, that they have a number of gyms and they're converting at about 10 percent of their leads and he's like you you, you guys are getting 20 percent and i was like 20% minimum is what we expect. And he was just in disbelief because mm. he's like, I don't know anyone that converts to that level. It's like, yeah, because mm. most people in the fitness space are still not good at selling, but it's yeah. a, people think they need leads. Um, and there are people that generally do need leads mm. and inquiries, but they also need to just up their sales process like game. But because they've done a sales training five years ago, they go, I know how to sell, mm. which I think is a very silly mentality because, you know, I, I know how to sell, but I still look at trainings you know most weeks and i'm looking and i'm still learning every single time so i i do i do i do agree with what you've just said there um but yeah just to just to go like right to the core i think most gym owners have just backed the wrong horse so it's quite a quite a, a deep kind of conversation but they've they've built the wrong model and they're now trying to trying to make something happen that's never going to get them to where they want to go. So their their pricing's wrong, their model's wrong, and they have no means other than the thing that they did at the start was they built it on inspiration of other gyms down the road. And they looked at what they're charging and what they're doing, and maybe they plucked a number kind of out of thin air. Mm. Yeah. You know, they, they either went, you know, like, like, like most gyms, they either went, I'm going to do a CrossFit gym, seems cheap enough to set up and I'm going to charge, you know, that gym down the road, they've got 300 members and they're charged, I don't know, 60 pound. I'm going to charge 59 pound. So I'm going to try to beat them just a little bit. And what happens is you just got this race to the bottom where everyone's either rushing down. So how do you figure out your pricing? Because, because I, 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 I totally agree. I've had so many people go, oh, well, maybe I should see what they're charging. But it's like, mm -hmm. no, it's about what you want to earn. And that's where the numbers start. Like it's, the bottom line is like, how much? What do you want to get from this business? Mm. And then the numbers follow. Yeah, that's kind of where I sit. But what? What? what yeah, what's but your that's stance? that's such a tough one because most of them, they've got limiting beliefs on either what it is they can achieve or what it is they deserve. So that's a huge that's a huge issue. Or alternatively, like if they actually did those numbers, they'd realize they probably sh probably should just stay a PT. Like you're making six and a half grand a month as a PT, don't open up a gym. Just carry on PTing, you're fine. If you want to open up a gym, so eventually in the next two, three years, you've got a decent income, but you've got team running it and you've now bought yourself a little bit of time. Okay, now that's a different thing because you're trying to build a business rather than just fulfill time and sell time. The, the nature of the problem that we see with many gym owners is they just don't know how to do gym ownership but they also aren't really prepared to admit that they don't know how to do gym ownership. And gym ownership isn't sales, it's not marketing, it's not leadership. It's all of that and so much more. And then I think the biggest thing is just having a, a clear strategy on how you get out from your current situation. Far too many young, uh, when I say young, I don't mean by age, but I mean by maturity as, 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 as a gym owner, they, 
they put too many service offerings on because they think that the more they offer, the more value it is, right? Which isn't the case. They try to compete on price, which means that you're just going to be a very, very easy commodity and people are only going to buy on price. And then, and then if they are going to go down on the value side, it's like, are you good enough to charge that thing? And do you have all the requisite skills to get those kind of people to come to, to come to your house, for, for example? But if it was a personal training product delivered in a small group setting of a six to one, and it reflects w roughly what personal training is in the town, less maybe 30, 40%, then you're sweet, you're good to go. And we've got data from hundreds of gyms. We ran a uh, collab survey with Black Box around gyms around the UK, Ireland, some in Europe, and we looked at average rates for large group, average rates for small group, um, average rent per square foot. Like we looked at all the numbers, try and find like a little kind of benchmark. And, you know, for example, a large group gym in rural like UK, if you're doing three sessions a week, it can't be less than like 140 pounds. Anything less than that, you literally can't grow this thing. Because every time you get to a level of clients that you're making a bit of money, but now you need to hire another coach, your operating expenses come close to that level. And then you go again and then again, and you literally, you, 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 you're going one step forward, one step back, one step forward, one so step back. So even if you grow, you don't really grow because you, every, every expense you've got to put into it. So you, the, the numbers look bigger, yeah. but you're just in the same spot kind of as you were before, yeah. really. Yeah, if the margins are the same or worse, like what was the point? Mm. So, you know, so that's large group, small group, you know, it needs to be rural north of 200 for two sessions a week um, as a minimum, right? Otherwise, it doesn't, it literally doesn't work. And do you think that is that is probably the biggest thing that most people in this kind of independent gym space is, is that they're just not charging enough. <laughs> they're not charging enough, but they're also not good enough, good enough to, to, charge. to charge more. Do yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? It's and a circle, yeah. It's like it's 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 a horrible circle of life. I think I think if I if I were to if I were to sum it up in the words of Charlie Horton was you recently joined Madison's and your words to me were, I've never paid more for fitness than I do now and I've never respected it as much as I do now. Yeah, yeah. Right? That stuck with me. I'll, I'll never forget that. I love the way you put that. But that is the same thing for you as a gym owner. You've never, never respected your education as much as you do when you paid big money for it. Your coaching practice, your gym, your mentorship, whatever it is. So it starts with you and your ability to value yourself and say, I'm worth that thing. And then by proxy, you'll be able to charge the thing that you feel you're worth because you've put in the work prior to actually charge the thing that like you're trying to deliver. But if we if we look at, <laughs> oh, are you gonna send me down a rabbit hole here? <laughs> if we look at small group PT as it pertains today, it's a fucking shit show because Everyone is saying they're doing small group PT, but they've got eight to one, they've got 10 to one, they've got 12 to one. That's not small group PT. That's a poorly attended large group class. It's a class size that you created based on the space and based on being kind of cheap enough to get eight people in the room or 10 people in the room, whatever it is. And that was where you felt comfortable because you were too scared to charge proper small group money. Mm. You also then, if you look at the delivery, and like we do this, we it actually takes us two days to show this in literal terms because I can say it and I'll, I'll share it now, but like Fionn and Gavin's perfect example, their attrition rate was above 12% at some of their sites. And I, <clears throat> they did, they invested FFC, so they put FFC, um, they put all their coaches on the FFC education and they came to the two day seminar in um, in Dublin. And their attrition rate is now down to 3%. Wow, really, that's amazing. And because they've got so many sites, mm. below 3% is very, that's very good. Yeah, well, well, well done boys. Yeah. yeah, well done boys. But they, they had their head coach, um, I made him deliver a small group PT session in front of everyone. 
And it, it must be the most scariest, intimidating thing to do, having me and Mass and 45 other people in the room watch you coach and you need to shine, right? Like it's scary. Only, only to know that I've also said at some point I'm going to cut your legs off and it's going to feel horrible, but this is the best learning experience. So what he did was he had his he had six clients in front of him, all different levels of of ability, and as he was delivering, it was well communicated. Everyone was well organized. Everyone was doing whatever. And by the standard of coaching that people think coaching is today, it was well instructed. Instructed, it wasn't coaching. I then cut his legs off from him. I'm like, okay, cool, stop. I asked the room, I was like, what have you noticed? And they're like, his communication was great. He did this with her, whatever, whatever. It was like, sweet. And then I took those six and I said, okay, now watch. And I delivered what is small group personal training, which is personal training delivered in a small group setting. Very different. Where I was able to facilitate six different people's journey in the moment, on the moment, on the fly, based on the patterns that were on the board, that felt individual to them, but also part of it that didn't feel isolated. Now, you have to see it to be able to understand it, and hence why I'm like, it took us two days to explain and, and demonstrate and show, because all the science that comes before and then the practice that comes after. And at the end, they were like, that makes sense. Like, now it makes sense. And you think that's where people go wrong, because obviously it's small group PT, small group PT, but you just said like, it's personal training. Mm. And if you go on the Madison's website, it says personal training. Mm. And you know, when I when I train there, there's there's p other people in the session, but I'm not, you know, we're not doing like warm ups together. I, I generally feel like I'm in a PT session and I've got a PT there. But there's other people there training, but I, I'm not typically interacting with them. I'm doing my own thing. Is that how it should it should be? 100% to a degree. Yeah, it should feel like personal training. It should be your story, your experience, your challenge, you know, within PFC education, we talk about three key things. Movement quality, right? I need you to move well. And me as your coach, I need to make sure that I can put you into positions that allow you to move well. I need the exercise selection that I prescribe to you to be that of the right prescription to you so that you can move extremely well. I need to get adequate challenge. So I need to make it hard enough for you that is challenging not too hard that your movement quality goes to shit, but not too soft that I'm keeping you safe. So what's the right amount of challenge? And then finally is like, does it feed the function? Does it feed the purpose? Does it feed like your goals and where we're trying to go? And if we can do those three things with any kind of coaching interaction on the floor. So yeah, there was a guy in boardroom who had put his prices up and it significantly changed his his profits. I think he had, yeah, you're right, about 40 grand worth of profits in, in three months, which is you know fantastic um but what what you don't know about that story is his business is very profitable and it had grown really fast and uh all organic as well like like very much an organic growth but what had slipped in was some culture pieces around things that he didn't stand for and the brand didn't stand for and he didn't want his business to to stand for and like you and I spoke off air before we started this podcast is people think success is like, obviously like the Instagram up, down, up, down, up, down. But as of yesterday, I came up with this idea of like, actually it goes in this like oodle loop, like circles and moments of like spring, summer, blossoming, shining, great vibes. And then like an autumn and a winter where you're like pruning, you're shaving, you're, you're iterating, you're cutting off dead wood and cutting out the fluff and getting rid of the clients that don't actually serve the culture, what have you, and then we go again, and you just keep doing that. And that's that's you, your growth, your behaviors, your clients, your values, like all of it. Like it's this constant like evolution and um, shedding the skin that, what one, that was once who you were. So this particular guy, he had looked at his business with this taste and like frustration and it was like this is not what I this is not what I want my business to stand for like how's our how's our marketing become this how's our clients only care about that like what's happened where did I lose this and uh it was it was fucking brave of him to go where am I going wrong and we were like this 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 and he was like 
or how do I fix it? It's like prices go up, cut the fat. And he, and he lost a lot of members. Like, I think the best part is 60 members. Which, which is people's worst nightmare when doing yeah. a price increase, right? Mm. Is am I going to lose members? And you can figure out based on a percentage of increase how many you can afford to lose. But it was, a, as you said, a, a significant amount where if, if anyone listens to this lost 60 members overnight, mm. it, it would not be a fun situation. Yeah. So that took a lot of, yeah, a lot, a lot of gajonas to do. But if you ask him now, obviously three months later, or no, where are we? We're in May. So I think he did this end of last year. So if you ask him now, he would generally tell you he's never felt more proud of his business. And like, I, like that's something, that's one of my biggest reasons why I do the mentorship. So I just want to help gym owners genuinely look at their business with pride. Because I was once the gym owner who looked at my business and thought, what the, what the fuck is this? Like, this is not who I am. Um, I walked away because of that. Like, I would created something that, uh, like, didn't serve me, didn't serve my family, didn't serve my values, nothing. Um, you know, another great story, and you just said it, like, the cost of, lo- like, how much does it cost me to put my prices up? As, as we talk about a lot in the mentorship, what does it cost you not to put your prices up? Do you know what I mean? So it's like if we we share a client who I uh, won't share his name, but I mentored him, got his it was a PT studio, turned it into an SGPT facility, doing well. I then said, go to FMA because I need you to get leads now. You're ready for leads. So he left us, went to go work with you guys, took him from 15 grand months to 22 grand months. Then he got to 22 grand months came to us last year may and said okay i'm ready for mentorship now i want to join boardroom how much does it cost told him he was like cool i'll i'll, I'll sign up on friday i was like okay cool message him on friday oh i'll sign up next month is that okay something came up anyway i'm someone who i won't i won't follow up that that potential because if you're not making an effort to join i'm not going to chase you because like as much as i could probably get 10 percent more sales if I have to come after you, you don't want it enough. I don't want to deal with you. So uh, I left him. 12 months later, he messaged me. He's like, dude, I really need your help. Can we jump on a call? Jump on a call with him. Spoke to him, what day are we? Spoke to him Monday afternoon. I had my notes on my iPad from the conversation last year. Income he had last year, 22,178 pounds. Income this year, 22,760 pounds. In a 12 month period, you've grown your monthly income by 600 pounds. What on earth have you done for the last 12 months? Like, where have you spent your time? Where have you spent your energy? Like, what are you doing? And um, it's such a great example of like me then going to him. What did it cost you not to sign up 12 months ago? Mm. The, co- the cost of inaction. Correct. Yeah. Like, that's crazy. Yeah. Are there any other case studies of um of Jimmy Network clients that you know that are just killing it at the moment? Um that 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 you want to share that have had a a very common problem that these other people have had in the past? We've kind of gone over I say price increase is one of them, but obviously there was culture issues. Yeah. Attrition, which was fee on. I think I think fundamentally we're, like we're really proud of the work that we're doing there. And um it would be easy to flex from a income standpoint of how much turnover we've helped them generate and all that kind of stuff but there comes a time in a in a business owner's journey where they realize that turnover is is vanity and and that's saying like turnover turnover vanity profit sanity whatever it is whatever that is but where they realize that actually it's much more than just money it's fulfillment it's pride it's uh, team all those other really cool feeling things that then also when you look at the numbers, you go, I'm building wealth, I'm building um, profits, I'm able to reinvest into my gym, I'm able to reinvest into my team. All of a sudden they get into this really cool place. Now, when you ask me that, there's a few things that come to mind. I recently did a podcast on hours with Tom and Chloe, who again, met them with you guys uh, at an FMA event. Um, And I was talking to them at the bar that night and they were like we're really frustrated we don't know where to take our business xyz all these all these things i was like what are you hoping like this business does for you like well one day we want to be able to build a build a house by the sea 
I was like, that's a fucking cool goal. It's like, you know, we want to have a small family and do that. And I was like, that's that's some purpose that I want to get behind. So when we went in and and uh, we took them on a strategy to get them out, and lo and behold, it was it was very tough for them, um, being able to get them from an indoor boot camp, really, to now a high end personal training facility. What a journey they've been on! But now, more turnover than what, like they had three hundred members, and we culled it down to like one hundred and fifty. Oh wow! But it's much higher price point than obviously the 300 more turnover home. more profit team everything else probably less stress because you're dealing with less yeah, members yeah so that's a great story but that's one that like like they 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 came up they did every F pfca course during the 12 month period because they we agreed that the thing that was missing was their self-worth being able to charge what i need them to charge now so that's an incredible story another one is there's these guys who we work with together um, I took them on and um, got them from, they were, let's call it a functional training facility, not CrossFit, trying to be CrossFit. Um, they were doing 8,000 pounds a month, uh, busy, loads of members, every class was full, unlimited membership, wrong model, all the rest of it. And their words were, we need help. We're working every hour and every time we look in the bank account, there's no money. I don't know what we're doing wrong. That was last year, April. This year, April, they recorded monthly recurring revenue at twenty-eight thousand pounds by just fixing the model. Just by fixing the model. Well, so, I mean, obviously, there's other things around it, but yeah. the main thing is that they yeah. got their model in place. Yeah, we reinvest. We redesigned the gym. They had like um, they had a physio room in a small facility, and they were like. I said, we're ripping that out. Give the physio notice, he's out in a month. And they're like, no, we can't do that. It makes us 600 pound a month. I was like, 600 pound a month. Mm -hmm. I was like, I will promise you, I will triple that if you get me that room. So they got rid of it. And again, great example of like, they just don't know, No, like no one's, no one's teaching you this stuff. Yeah. Um, but all those stories, you know, um, my, my, my my colleague Ben, he shared something today around um, recent case studies of ours whom have gone through the model switch, which is traumatic for many people if they've never done it before. Do you, do, does it take a, uh, a little while for that process to take place? Because obviously you, we talk about it here like, oh, I'll just swap the model over. But yeah. how long does it, does it depend? Is it a process? It depends on it depends on it depends on you and your attitude to risk, your level of frustration. Like like sometimes you're so frustrated that you're like, fuck it, I'm doing it right now. I don't care what the consequences are. I just want to know who are my people and I can crack on. Like we talk about whatever decisions you make, you're making for the next hundred members, not the current. Right. And that's a really important mindset to get into. But there's a few constituent parts that really make a difference as to how successful this is. It is always going to come down to how good is the coaching team? Do you even have a team? How much can we, I talk about like your wax on, wax off phase. What do I need you and your team to do to wax on, wax off, karate kid type vibe? Watch the education, do the courses, whatever it is that we can provide between us and the PFCA so that you can go to this new model let members experience it and be of the value that you ought to be, right? So for some people, that might be a six, 12 month journey. Some people might be six weeks in and we're gonna do it. But the most important thing about all of that is most gym owners don't do the thing, whatever that thing is, price change, model change, fire the coach, whatever, purely because they are avoiding the difficult conversation. And they are petrified at what it's going to cost them to do, how much they're going to offend people, what other people are going to think about them, how it's going to ruin their reputation, all these things. And it's horrible, it is. And when, when you've not done it, it's scary, and you do it the first time, it's hard. But when you've been in business for long enough, as you know, that's like, that literally becomes child's play because every day is a tough conversation a direct conversation, a hard conversation that you actually need to develop a bit of um, skin in the game to actually handle those. 
So your first one is a bit of a baptism of fire, but it's a necessary one because when you get to a place where you're able to do price increase, uh, price increases, for example, from a non-emotive, financial, strategic point of view that fits product market fit, that allows you to pay your staff and revamp the gym or do whatever you need to do, like it just becomes a decision that you just make. You do it with best practice, good principles, but you just do the thing. There's no emotion, right? Like you, you and you and I both know this. When you do price increases, the people who leave surprise you because you're like, oh, I thought you were like a, a lifer. Do you know what I mean? Like, like some people just surprise you and it's like, okay. But when you get so emotional about it, like then you go bury your head, emotion kills, just go date. It's like, look, okay, we can go. And Ollie and I did this when we, we took, um, we took, so we did it aggressively with Stratford recently. That was, that was intense. Um, we when you said you did it aggressively with stratford was that we got the pricing wrong when we first launched it yeah um we had to get the pricing way up to what it needed to be and we had the policy wrong so um the pausing culture within that gym was far greater than we had ever seen before as in i need to pause for two months or two weeks or yeah yeah i need to pause because i'm going on holiday or whatever and it was one that it was one that we found extremely annoying because if you looked at if you looked at true attrition as in members leaving pretty low if you looked at attrition with pauses in that which is a more accurate representation it was really high and i was like this doesn't make any sense the product sick like all this sick, whatever and uh we aggressively changed the pricing and we got rid of that so we changed the policy. Just completely. got rid of no, 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 no pause in. A march on gym, you cannot pause. You're a member or you're not, right? Because we want it to be an exclusive members club, not a come in, come out transactional thing. Was there, was there, was there a hit at all that, that huge happened? Hit. Yeah, huge hit. Um, but it was one that Ollie and I were like, we have to back ourselves for what we want, not what we currently have. Yeah. Right? Um, and with the mentorship, we did this when we went from PFCA to gym owner network. And we took it from what was, you know, I think we were charging 500 quid a month to now, you know, different levels, but closer to 900 or 1800, or whatever it was. And we were like, we have to back ourselves to start from zero and go after it properly rather than keep doing what we're currently doing. Yeah, because you kind of almost like dabbled with the gym helping the gym owners essentially it wasn't like super clear through pfca right there was like not a distinction between pfca like core education mm. and helping gym owners it was all like in the same under the same umbrella yeah because basically go back to when we first launched the aim was to become such a big education provider that we could almost become a governing association type thing that was the intention then then um then lockdown happened and personal trainers all over the world were freaking out and we provided um six weeks of free education via zoom and we were having 600 coaches tune in live to these free calls and that ended up being the catalyst of launching the brand we we were going to launch by doing seminars all around the country and it, it completely changed so we did that and after those six weeks we had people go we want like we want more with you so we launched a mentorship then which actually strategically was it going to be the thing we brought much, much later down the line? So we launched a PT mentorship. And like CMAC is a great example of someone who joined the mentorship then. Justin Nusi then. Like all those people, they joined then. So we had mentored them. They graduated to becoming gym owners. And then Ollie started work, working with like a select group of gym owners to try and facilitate their journey. And then, and this was all lockdown. So we we're all just like trying to do our own thing. After lockdown, Ollie was like, there's no point us running a PFCA mentorship and me looking after 10 gym owners in Powered by March on. So we consolidated that and we had a gym owner level and we had our PT level. And we did that informally without any marketing and grew that to 100, 120 PTs and gym owners. And it was great for, for a while it lasted. But during that whole time, we were building the education, all that kind of stuff. And then we spent no time 
on that other than just basic fulfillment to the point in which in April last, or March last year, we decided to relaunch um, and separate entirely and launch the Gym Owner Network, which allowed us to facilitate the message. And it's, it's, a, it's a great example of like, uh, marketing often is best facilitated by doing what it says on the tin. Do you know what I mean? So gym owner network literally just does what it says on the tin. Mm. Fitness marketing agency does exactly what it says on the tin. So uh, by doing that, and then obviously with the fact that March on Gyms is gym owner network and vice versa, that's our that's our proving ground. That's our testing ground. I remember when you guys came down uh, and did like a module and it was just PFCA and... Um, I don't know if you remember this conversation, but I was like, it's like, you've got this here, but you need to have these like different levels where people can see it. So not that you wouldn't have done it anywhere about me, but I'm going to take a, a, a t- tiny bit of credit for potentially planting the seed for to have to have that different take level Take all there. the credit you want, <laughs> Charlie. You're, you're very good but, at your job, bro. But um, when it comes to your own network, like where can people find out about you? Like next step, if they want to find out more. Obviously, you've got the podcast with clients that you've recently had that have come out. Like where can they find you? Where can they find out more? Oh, uh, man. So... Yeah, I mean, the Gym Owner Network, you can find us on Instagram, Gym Owner Network. Um, You can also find me on Instagram, coach underscore gens. I will generally share a thoughtful gym owner every morning. I have done... I think those are very good, by the way. (laughs) Generally, I think they're very good. Oh, thanks, man. Um, Done that every day since Feb last year. Um, Do you have days where you struggle, though? You're like, what am I going to say today? Or does it come quite easily? I always either reflect on the conversation I had previously... Or I go back to what I wish someone told me when I was a gym owner. Nice. So it's always very, very much uh, relatable. Um, but yeah, like we we put up good energy on the podcast, uh, the PFCA and Gym Owner Network podcast. You can find it on like Apple, Spotify, whatever. Um, outside of that, like our, our aim is to truly help like the coach-led facility owners like truly thrive. Um, so those who want to have a high impact, high yielding coach led facility, whether it's a large group, whether it's a CrossFit box, whether it's a small group PT facility, whether you don't know what you need to be doing, but you, you're a great coach and you want to do better for your community. Like if that's you, then we can truly help. I think a lot of the conversation that you would have heard from today is, is all about just like leading yourself and, and leading others. And I just, everything that we do, we try and just make like a little bit of impact for that one person listening. Yeah, and you, and, and you guys are definitely leading by example with everything you're doing with March on online and everything else. Like you guys are, we've said this in the last podcast, but like you, you guys are just hard workers, right? Like we see you every day doing your thing and um, I've, I've, I've always got to respect it because you guys just keep on going. So like all the respect to you and Ollie for all you guys are doing, pushing the brand forward. Um, I truly do believe that March from Gyms is, you know, one of the biggest and best um, in the UK and you guys are generally leading by example. So everyone listening to this, I do urge you to obviously follow Jens on um, Instagram because the stuff he says is generally um, very, very valuable and it's all free. Check out the podcast. We'll place all the links down below on the show notes um, as well. And Jens, just keep doing what you're doing because you're generally impacting many people for the better and it's um, it's great to see. Thank you, man. You too, dude. You're an absolute legend. And thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the Fitness Marketing Agency podcast. If you enjoyed it, make sure to subscribe so you can catch future episodes.